These days, it feels like science is catching up with our wildest dreams. Projects to bring back extinct animals aren't just theories anymore, they're happening. Woolly mammoths might be roaming the Arctic again in the next few years. Scientists are working hard to revive the thylacine, the famous Tasmanian tiger. Even the dodo, that odd bird from Mauritius, has a shot at a second life. And just recently, researchers managed to create pups with traits inspired by the mighty dire wolves. Not true dire wolves, but genetically edited wolves carried by domestic dogs as surrogate mothers. It's exciting, it's a little surreal, but there's one Ice Age all-star that's noticeably missing from this de-extinction party. Smilodon the legendary saber-toothed cat. Yeah, the one often called the saber-toothed tiger, even though it wasn't technically a tiger. A lot of people can't help but wonder, why aren't scientists trying to bring back the saber-toothed cat? I mean, come on, who wouldn't want to see a real-life Smilodon prowling around? It was an apex predator, a total rock star of its time. We're working on dire wolves and mammoths and all that, so why not the saber-toothed cat? First off, DNA, the blueprint of life. If you want to bring an extinct animal back, you need some of its DNA. No DNA, no way to clone it, or even to genetically engineer a proxy. The reason we're even able to consider species like the woolly mammoth or the thylacine is that we have retrievable DNA from them. Woolly mammoths, for example, have been found frozen in Siberian permafrost, literally locked in ice for thousands of years. In those icy conditions, a lot of their tissue, fur, skin, maybe even blood are preserved. Scientists have sequenced the woolly mammoth genome from bits of these remains, so we have a pretty complete genetic blueprint of mammoths to work with. The Tasmanian tiger went extinct more recently in the 1930s, and there are preserved pelts and even baby thylacines kept in jars of alcohol in museums, from which researchers have gotten DNA. The dodo went extinct around the 17th century, and we have some well-preserved bones and maybe tissue from museum specimens or mummified remains on Mauritius that yielded usable DNA for sequencing its genome. Even the dire wolf. There was a big study where scientists extracted DNA from ancient dire wolf bones, like ones preserved in permafrost or dry caves, and managed to sequence a bunch of their genome. So for these creatures, we at least have their genetic code, or most of it written out. It's step one of any de-extinction attempt. Now, Smilodon. Ugh, this is where we hit the first brick wall. Smilodon died out about 10,000 years ago. And where do we find most Smilodon fossils? In places like the La Brea Tar Pits in California or other fossil-rich sites in the Americas. The tar pits are amazing. They trapped loads of animals and preserved their bones beautifully. We have hundreds of Smilodon skeletons from La Brea alone, which is how we know so much about its anatomy. But tar is not a friendly place for DNA. DNA is an organic molecule, and over thousands of years, especially in a warm environment like tar or soil in temperate climates, it breaks down. Unlike mammoths, Smilodon wasn't preserved in ice, at least none that we've found so far. Instead, we get bones that sat in tar or dirt for millennia. That means by now, the genetic material is basically dust. Scientists have tried to find DNA in some saber-toothed cat fossils. I remember reading that a few projects managed to recover tiny fragments of DNA from Smilodon or its relatives, but these are like little snippets, not anywhere close to a full genome. Alright, but let's imagine that we somehow did have most of the Smilodon genome, or could infer it. Why not just take a modern big cat and edit its DNA to match? That leads us to the next major issue, genetic distance. Smilodon might look like a big cat, and it is in the cat family but it's not like the tiger or lion that we know today. Smilodon and other saber-toothed cats split off on the cat family tree a long, long time ago. How long? Try around 20 million years of separation from any living cat species. That's an eternity in evolution terms. For comparison, lineages of mammoths and modern elephants split maybe 5 or 6 million years ago, and the thylacine is even closer to some living marsupials since it only went extinct recently. But Smilodon is this weird distant cousin of today's lions, tigers, and house cats that branched off way back in the Miocene epoch, and did its own thing. There are no saber-toothed cats left. That whole subfamily is gone, so the closest living relatives we have are Pantherinae, lions, tigers, jaguars, or maybe slightly smaller cats. Even the clouded leopard, which might superficially remind you of a saber-toothed build, is genetically far apart. Why does this matter? 
because all the de-extinction projects rely on having a close living relative as a sort of genetic template or surrogate. The idea for a mammoth is basically to start with an Asian elephant, which shares about 99% of its DNA with a woolly mammoth, and then edit that 1% of differences to turn it into a mammoth-like creature. With the thylacine, they're looking at one of its closest relatives, a dasyurid marsupial called a fat-tailed dunnart. The dunnart is a lot smaller and a very distant cousin of the thylacine, but genetically, it's one of the nearer options, and they hope to modify dunnart cells step by step to eventually approximate a thylacine genome. The dodo's closest living relative is the nicobar pigeon, so scientists might try to use pigeon DNA slash eggs as the starting point and tweak them until we get something dodo-esque. In each case, there's at least a playbook, find a close living species and alter it. For Smilodon, there is no close substitute species to start with. The gap between a saber-toothed cat and a lion is enormous. You can't just take a lion genome and flip a few switches to get a saber tooth. You'd have to flip thousands of switches. In fact, you'd basically have to rewrite the lion's entire genetic code to match what we think Smilodon's code was. We're nowhere near capable of that level of genetic engineering. It's not like editing a few genes for cold resistance or thicker fur. It's redesigning an animal from the ground up. Right now, CRISPR and gene editing technology are amazing, but making a few dozen edits is about the limit of what's been done in big organisms. Making potentially tens of thousands of edits without making a mistake, that's science fiction for the foreseeable future. The more distant the extinct animal is from any living one, the harder it gets exponentially. This brings up another practical challenge. Who's going to be the mom? Cloning and de-extinction isn't just about DNA. It's about growing an embryo and carrying it to term. For something like a Smilodon, you would presumably need a surrogate mother from a living species, a big cat that could handle giving birth to a saber-toothed kitten, maybe a lioness or a tigress. They're the closest in size and anatomy we've got. But even if you could fertilize a lion's egg with some pseudo-Smilodon DNA, there's no guarantee the embryo would develop correctly. The lion's body has evolved to nurture lion embryos, not something from a completely different branch of the family. The pregnancy could fail at any number of stages. If the hormones, placenta, or developmental timing are incompatible, it could be a long series of miscarriages or non-viable embryos, which would be heartbreaking and a nightmare from an animal welfare perspective. Think about it. Would it be fair to subject a living lion or tiger to an experimental pregnancy with a genetically Frankensteined embryo? There's a real ethical issue there. Even with elephants and mammoths, some propose trying to avoid using a living elephant as a surrogate by creating an artificial womb. That tech isn't here yet for a mammoth, let alone something like a Smilodon, which would require presumably a big cat surrogate. And even if a lioness could carry a Smilodon cub to term, we have no idea what complications might arise. Smilodon babies might have been larger, or maybe their gestation length was different. We simply don't have data on that. It would be a shot in the dark biologically. Now, let's say by some miracle we bypass both of these giant hurdles. We somehow get a viable Smilodon embryo and a healthy surrogate to birth it. Boom! A saber-toothed kitten is born. What then? Do we just high-five and say, welcome back to the world, kitty, and release it into Los Angeles? That would be a disaster, to put it mildly. The modern world is completely different from the world Smilodon used to roam. North America, 10,000 years ago, was full of huge herbivores. Mammoths, mastodons, giant ground sloths, giant bison, camels, horses, and even woolly rhinos in some places during colder times. South America had its suit of giant creatures like giant sloths, glyptodons, and herds of large camelids and such. Smilodon was built to hunt those hefty animals. Its whole anatomy, powerful forelimbs, a strong neck, those massive saber teeth, was likely optimized for taking down big, thick-skinned prey and maybe finishing them off with a precise bite. Now fast forward to today, those prey species are gone. Who would our resurrected Smilodon hunt? The closest living thing in North America might be bison, which still exists, thankfully, or moose, or maybe elk. Those are big, but not as abundant everywhere and mostly live in managed herds or protected parks. South America today has like capybaras and deer, nothing like a mammoth for a mega cat to tackle. In desperation, a hungry Smilodon might go after cattle on ranches or even people. That obviously would be a huge problem. You can't just have a giant predator on the loose in a world full of unsuspecting humans and no proper ecological niche. Even if we tried to put it in a controlled setting, 
say a huge fenced reserve, we'd have to reconstruct an ecosystem for it. You can't have a lone Smilodon sitting in a field expecting it to survive. It needs to exercise natural behaviors. What other animals do we put in with it? Maybe we'd also have to resurrect some Pleistocene prey or use modern proxies like letting it prey on African buffalo or something, which is logistically crazy. Shipping African megafauna to wherever the Smilodon is, it starts to sound like building a mini Jurassic Park, doesn't it? A cool exhibit for sure, but is it a real wild existence for the animal? Not really. It would essentially be a Pleistocene theme park enclosure. There's also evidence that Smilodon may have been social, or at least lived in groups, a bit like lions do. Many Smilodon fossils were found together in the tar pits, suggesting maybe packs or prides of them were around. Or they all died trying to scavenge the same carcass and got stuck. That's also possible. If they were social, then bringing back just one would be like having a single lone wolf or one lion without a pride. Not ideal for the animal's mental health, but bringing back a whole group of saber-tooths multiplies all the challenges by 10. That's nowhere near feasible at the moment. So environmentally and socially, a resurrected Smilodon would struggle in the modern world. The climate is warmer, though Smilodon did live in some warm areas, so that part might be okay. But more importantly, the ecosystem it knew is gone. It would be a fish out of water, or rather, a prehistoric predator out of its time. We'd be forcing it into a world where it doesn't really belong, and it could suffer, or cause others to suffer as a result. So, with all that said, you can see why the Smilodon isn't on the de-extinction roster, even while mammoths, thylacines, and dodos are. The DNA is too scarce and degraded. The genetic gap is too wide. There's no obvious surrogate species to carry a baby Smilodon. The engineering required is sci-fi level. And even if you surmounted all that, the poor cat would enter a world where it has no niche, and we'd have to question the ethics of bringing it into that situation. That's all for today. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. You can also leave a comment with what you would like to see in the following videos. Thanks for watching. See you next time.